Chapter 11, The Dueling Club <sighs> Harry woke up on the Sunday morning to find the dormitory blazing with winter sunlight and his arm red reboned, but very stiff. He sat up quickly and looked over at Colin's bed, but it had been blocked from view by the high curtains. Harry had changed behind yesterday. Seeing that he was awake, Madame Pomfrey came over Bustingling over there with a breakfast tray and began bending and stretching his arms and fingers. All in order, she said clumsily and fed himself. Porridge, left-handed. When you finished, you may leave. Harry dressed quickly. He could see. He hurried off to Gryffindor Tower, desperate to tell Ron and Hermione about Colin and Dobby. But they weren't there. Harry left and looked for them, wondering where they were, and feeling slightly hurt that they weren't interested in whether he had bones back or not. As Harry passed the library, Percy Weasley strode out of it, looking far better spears than the last time they'd met. Oh, hello, Harry, he said. Excellent flying yesterday, really excellent. Gryffindor was just taking the lead for the house cup. You earned us fifty points. You haven't seen Ron or Hermione, have you? said asked Harry. No, I haven't, said Percy, smiling, f fading. I hope Ron isn't in another girl's toilet. Harry forced laughed, watched Percy walk out of sight, and then headed straight for Morning Myrtle's bathroom. He couldn't see why Ron and Hermione would be there again, but after making sure that neither Filch or any prefects were around, he opened the door and heard their voices coming from the locked stall. It's me, he said, closing the door behind him. There was a clunk and a splash and a gasp from within the stall, and he saw Hermione's eyes peering through the keyhole. Harry, she said, oh, you gave us such a fright. Come in. How's your arm? Fine, said Harry, squeezing into the stall. An old cauldron was perched in the toilet. The crackling from the under the rim told Harry that it had lit a fire beneath it, conjuring up a portable water-proof fires. It was especially of Hermione's. We've come to meet you, but decided to get a start on the polyjuice potion. Ron explained to Harry with difficulty, locked in the stall again. We've decided that this is the safest place to hide it. Harry started to tell them about Colin, but Hermione interrupted. We already know. We heard Professor Mount McGonagall telling Professor Flitwick this morning. That's why we decided we'd better get it going. The sooner we get a confession out of Malfoy, the better, snarled Ron. Do you know what I think? He was in such a foul temper after the Quidditch match. He took it all on Colin. Well, there's something else, said Harry, watching Hermione, tearing bundles of knot grass and throwing them in to the potion. Toby came to visit me in the middle of the night. Ron and Hermione looked amazed. Harry told them everything about Toby had told him, or hadn't told him. Hermione and Ron listened, with, within their mouths opened. The Chamber of Secrets has been opened before, Hermione said. This settles it, said Ron. In a triumphant voice, Lucius Malfoy must have opened that chamber when he was at school here, and now he's, oh dear, oh Draco, how to do it. It's obvious. Wish Daddy had told you what kind of monster is in there, though. I don't know. What, I, I want to know how come nobody's noticed it's sneaking around the school. Maybe it can make itself invisible, said Hermione, prodding leeches at the bottom of the cauldron, or maybe it can disguise itself, pretend to be a suit of armor or something. I've read about uh, chameleon ghouls. You read too much, Hermione, said Ron, pouring dead lace wings on top of the leeches. He crumpled up the empty, empty lace wing bag and looked at Harry. So, Toby stopped us from putting, getting on the train and broke your arm. He shook his head. You know what, Harry? If he doesn't stop trying to save you, your life, he's going to kill you. The news that Colin Creevy had been attacked 
was now li- li- was now lying as though dead in the hospital. Wing had spread through the entire school by Monday morning, and it was air suddenly thick with rumor and spe- suspicion. The first years now were moving around the castle in a light knit groups as though scared that they would be attacked for anything that they ventured forth alone. Jeanie Weasley, who sat next to Colin Creevy and Charms, was distraught. But Harry felt that Fred and George were going to the wrong way about it, cheering her up. They were taking turns, covering themselves with fur and boils, and jumping out of, at front, front from behind the statues. They only stopped when Percy... Apocalyptic with rage, told them that they were going to write Mrs. Weasley and tell her Ginny was having nightmares. Meanwhile, hidden from the teachers, a roaring trade of talismans, amulets, and other protective devices were sweeping through the school. Never Longbottom bought a long, large, evil smelling green onion. He pointed purple crystals and rotting newt tails before. Uh, other Gryffindor boys pointed out that there was no danger. He was a pure blood, and if therefore unlikely to be attacked. They went for Filch first, Neville said. He found his round face fearful, and everyone knows I'm almost a squib. The second week of December, Professor McGonagall came around an unusual collecting names of who was going to be staying at school for Christmas. Harry, Ron, and Hermione signed up for the, on the list. They had heard that Malfoy was staying, which struck them as very suspicious. The holiday would be a perfect time to use to Apologies Potion and try to worm a confession out of him. Unfortunately, the potion was only half finished. They still needed... Uh, by a corn horn and bloomslang skin, and the only place that they were able to get that was from Snape's private stores. Harry privately privately felt that they, he'd rather face Slytherin's legendary monster than let Snape catch him robbing his office. What we need, said Hermione briskly, as Thursday afternoon's double potions lessons loomed near, it's a diversion. Then one of my... One of us can sneak into Snape's office and take what we need. Harry and Ron looked at her nervously. I think I'd better do the actual stealing, Hermione continued, in a matter-of-fact tone. You two will be expelled if you get caught or in any more trouble. And I've got a clean record. So you'll need to do is cause enough mayhem to keep Snape busy for five minutes or so. Harry smiled feebly, deliberately causing mayhem in Snape's potions class was about as safe as poking sleeping bear dragon in the eye. The potions lesson took place in one of the large dungeons. Thursday afternoons, lessons proceeded as usual way. Twenty cauldrons all stood steaming between the wooden desk on which stood brass scales and jars of ingredients. Snape's prowled through the fumes, making waspish remarks about Gryffindor's work while the Slytherin sniggered appreciatively. Draco Malfoy, who was Snape's favorite student, kept licking, kept flickering puff of fish tails at Ron and Harry, who knew that if they retaliated, they would get a detention faster than you could say unfair. Harry's swelling solution was far too runny. He had had his mind on more important things. He was waiting for Hermione's signal, and he hurriedly listened to as Snape paused to sneer at his watery potion. When Snape turned and walked off to bully Neville, Hermione caught Harry's eye and nodded. Harry ducked swiftly down behind the cauldron, pulled one of Fred Filibuster's fireworks out of his pocket, and gave it a quick prod with his wand. The fireworks began to fuzz and sputter, knowing he only had seconds, Harry straightened up, took aim, and lobbed it into the air, landed right on target on Goyle's cauldron. Goyle's potion exploded and showering the whole class. People shrieked. Splashes of the swelling solution hit them. Malfoy got a faithful and his nose began to swell like a balloon. Goyle blundered around and his hands over his eyes, which were expanded to the size of a dinner plate. Snape was trying to restore home and find out what had happened, though 
through the confusion, Harry saw Hermione slip quietly into Snape's office. Silence! Silence! roared Snape. Anyone who has been splash, come here for deflating d drought. When I find out who did this... Harry tried not to laugh as he watched Malfoy hurry forward. He, his head was drooping with the weight of his nose. His small like melon and half of his class lumbered to Snape's desk, some way down with the arms like clubs, others unable to walk, talk through the gigantic puffed up lips. Harry was Hermione slide back into the, dr into the dungeon from the front of her robes bulging. When everyone was taking a swig of antidote and the various swellings had subsided, Snape swept over to Goyle's cauldron and scooped out a twisted black remains of a firework. There was sudden hush. If I ever find out who threw this, Snape whispered, I shall make sure that person is expelled. Harry arranged his face into what he hoped was a puzzled expression. Snape was looking right at him, and the bell that rang ten minutes later could not have been more welcome. He knew for he knew it was me, Harry told Ron and Hermione, as they hurried back to the moaning Myrtle's bathroom. I could tell. Hermione threw the new ingredients into the cauldron and began to stir feverishly. He'll be I'll be ready in two weeks, he said she said happily. Snape can't prove it was you, said Ron reassuringly to Harry. What can he do? Knowing Snape, something foul, said Harry, as the potion frothed and bubbled. A week later, Harry and Ron and Hermione were talking across the entrance hall when they saw a small knot of people gathered around noticed a board reading a piece of parchment that had been just pinned up by Seamus Finnegan and Do Dean Thomas beckoned them over to take looking excited. They're starting a dueling club, said Seamus. First meeting tonight. Oh, I wouldn't mind dueling lessons. They may come in handy one of these days. What do you reckon Slytherin monster can duel? said Ron. But he too, with a sign of interest. Could be useful, he said to Harry and Hermione as they went into dinner. Shall we go? Harry and Hermione were all for it. So right at eight o'clock. That evening they hurried to the great hall, and long dining tables had vanished, and golden stage had appeared along the wall. Thousands of candles floating overhead in the ceiling were velvety black, and more and more of the school seemed to be packed beneath it, carrying all their wands and looking excited. I wonder who will be teaching us, Hermione said as they edged into the, the chattering crowd. Someone told me it was Flitwick. He was a dueling champion when he was young. Maybe it'll be him. As long as it's not, Harry began, but he ended with a groan. Gilderoy Lockhart was walking onto the stage, resplendent in robes and a deep plum, and accompanied by none other than Snape, wearing his usual black. Lockhart waved his arm for silence and called, Gather round, gather round now. Everyone can, can everyone see me? Can you all hear me? Excellent. Now, Professor Dumbledore, he granted the permission to start this little dueling club to train you in case you may ever need to defend yourself. And I promise myself I have done countless occasions. For full details, see my published books. Let me introduce my assistant, Professor Snape, said Lockhart. Flashing a wide smile, he tells me he knows a tiny little bit about dueling himself and has sportingly agreed to help me with a short demonstration before we begin. Now, I don't want any of you youngsters to worry. You will still have your potions, Master, when I'm through with him. Fear, never fear. Wouldn't it be good if they just finished each other off? <laughs> Ron muttered in Harry's ear. Snape's upper lip was curling. Harry wondered why Lockhart was still smiling, as if Snape was looking at him like that he'd want he'd been running as fast as he could in the opposite direction. Lockhart and Snape turned to, to face each other, bowed, and then 
at least Lockhart did, with much twirling of his hands, whereas Snape jerked his head irritably. They ran, they raised their wounds, and then, like swords, were in front of them. As you see, we are holding our wounds in the accepted combat pit combative positions, Lockhart told the silent crowd. On the count of three, we will cast out our first spells. Neither of them will be aiming to kill, of course. I wouldn't bet on that, Harry murmured, watching Snape's <laughs> batting, bashing his teeth. One, two, three. Both of them swung their wands over their heads and pointed them in the opposite of, at the opponent. Snape cried, Expelliarmus! There was a dazzling flash of scarlet light, and Lockhart was blasted off his feet. He flew backwards off the stage, smashed onto the wall, and slid down and sprawled on the floor. Malfoy and some of the other Slytherins cheered. Hermione was dancing on tiptoe. Do you think he's all right? She squeaked before through her fingers. Who cares? said Harry and Ron together. Lockhart, getting up unsteadily to his feet... His hat had fallen off and his wavy hair standing on end. Well, there you have it, he said, tottering back onto the platform. That's what disarming charm. As you are, I've lost my wound. Ah, thank you, Miss Brown. Yes, excellent idea to show them that, Professor Snape. But if you don't mind me saying, so it was very obvious that you were about you to do. If I had warned you to stop... You to do you would have been only too uh, easy. However, I felt it would be instructive to let them see. Snape was looking murderous now. Possibly Lockhart had noticed because he said, "Okay, enough demonstrating. I'm going to come around amongst you now and put you into pairs, Professor Snape. If you'd like to help me." He moved through the crowd, matching up partners. Lockhart seemed team Neville with Justin Finch, Fletchy, but Snape reached Harry and Ron first. Time to split this dream team up, I think, he sneered. Weasley, you can partner Finnegan. Potter? Harry moved automatically towards Hermione. I don't think so, said Snape, smiling coldly. Mr. Malfoy, come over here. Let me see what you make of you famous Potter and you. Miss Granger, you can have a partner, Miss Bulstrode. Malfoy strutted over, smirking behind him walked a Slytherin girl who reminded Harry of a picture of what he'd seen at holidays with the Haggy. She was large and square, and her heavy jaw jutted aggressively. Hermione gave her a weak smile. She did not return. Face your partner, called Lockhart, back on the platform. And now, and bow. Harry and Malfoy barely inclined their heads, not taking their eyes off each other. Wounds ready, shouted Lockhart. When I count on the three, cast your charms and disarm your opponents. Only disarm them. We don't want any accidents. One, two, three. Harry swung his wand high, but Malfoy had already started on two. His spell hit Harry so hard that he felt, felt as though he'd been hit over the head with a saucepan. He stumbled, but everything still seemed to be working. And wasting no time, Harry pointed his wand at Malfoy and shouted, Picture sombra. The jet of silver light hit Malfoy in the stomach and he doubled over, wheezing. I said disarm only, Lockhart shouted, the alarm over the heads, but the battling crowd as Malfoy sank to his knees. Harry had him with hit them with the chickling charm, and he could barely move for laughing, and Harry turning back with a vague feeling it would be unsporting to bewitch Malfoy while he was on the floor. But that was a min mistake. Gasping for breath, Malfoy pointed his wand at Harry, his knees, and choked, choked, And the next second, Harry's legs began to jerk around and out of control in a kind of quick step. Stop! Stop! screamed Lockhart, but Snape took charge. Finit in cartium, he shouted. Harry's feet stopped dancing, Malfoy stopped laughing, and they were able to look up. A haze of greenish smoke was hovering over the scene. Both Neville and Justin were lying on the floor, panting. Ron was holding up an ashen-faced Seamus, apologizing for 
whatever he had broken his wand had done. But Hermione and Millicent Bulstrode were still moving. Millicent had Hermione in a headlock, and Hermione was whimpering in pain. Both their wands lay forgotten on the floor. Harry leapt forward and pulled Millicent off. It was difficult, but she was a lot bigger than he was. Dear, dear, said Lockhart, skittering through the crowd, looking at the aftermath duels. Up you go, Macmillan. Careful there, Miss Fawcett. Pinch, it's hard. It will stop bleeding in seconds. In second boot... Oh, I think I'd better teach you how to block on friendly spells, said Lockhart, standing flustered in the middle of the hall. He glanced at Snape, whose black eyes now were glittering, and looked quick, quickly away. Let's have a volunteer pair, Longbottom and Filchfeltry. How about you?